Non-farm payrolls clocked in at an increase of 678,000 in February, really pounding estimates into the ground. The unemployment rate ticked down to 3.8%. Nathan Sheets and Seema Shah are still with, with us. Nathan, I want to go over to you on, on the health of the consumer here because we did have flat wages uh, in the month of February at a time where inflation continues to rip higher. What's your read on the consumer? Are they about to head into a very dark place this spring? I'm watching that uh, real wage number uh, very closely. So how much are these, these average hourly earnings and other measures of compensation rising relative uh, to inflation? And it feels like that wages are losing uh, a little bit of ground here. And that why? is likely why, to be why a are they losing the ground? economy uh, Why do you think forward. they're losing ground? Wages. Uh, they're in losing this environment ground. Labor's so short. They're losing ground in the sense that uh, uh, wages are rising less than inflation is rising. So they, you know, headline inflation is at seven and a half, and these average hourly earnings are at five, and that's suggesting the real wages are, uh, uh, you know, falling up some. Now there are some offsets, and I would say the major offset is the fact that the labor market is so hot. So yeah, real wages diminished a bit, but lots of folks are uh, working and many others know that if they want a job, they can get one. So household incomes are, are holding in pretty well. So all in all, I'd say some risk from real wages, but I still stay relatively optimistic on the consumer and that the consumer can continue to uh, to to drive the recovery, but the risks around that are a little bit broader if we don't uh, if uh, we don't see strong performance in real wages, at least kind of a break even. I mean, Nathan, it's interesting because even if you allow for the compositional effects that you talked about in the sort of hangover, if you will, from January, to see a flat month over month change or not no change is still relatively alarming, and I wonder if you know anecdotally at least, even if the unemployment picture is very tight right now, you still hear about people who can't find a job, right? They say, well, the employment market's supposed to be so good. Why can't I find a job? And so that makes me wonder if there are still some pretty profound mismatches here that are still putting a cap on wage growth. This is, this is a very important point. And let me call it the disjuncture between the macro and the micro. And when I look at the macro data, in terms of labor market, I say, wow, you know, this is, this is a hot labor uh, report that we're seeing this morning. It's a hot labor market. And when I look at other indicators, there's lots of demand for labor. Uh, but then when we go out there, you know, there are many people who are still looking around. Now, I would ask, well, are they looking for any job or are they looking for the job that you know they've kind of desired or wanted for a long time? Or another way to put it is, how selective uh, are they are they being? Uh, so I think that you know there is even within a strong labor market there are micro issues of matching, and they're creating problems for workers who can't find that job or one that they want to take, and they're finding uh, uh, making it difficult for. Uh, firms, particularly like uh, in the services sector and restaurants, to find uh, the workers that they need. So lots of complexities underneath this. And I agree that that can create challenges for, uh, you know, broad swaths of the household sector. It seems we need more unskilled labor in this economy. If we're going to get uh, a gradual move on rates, like Nathan uh, suggests, you have that hot labor market here. Isn't one of the best places to be tech? Uh, this appears to be uh, something uh, of a similar environment to what we saw in the latter part of last year in tech work well. Yeah, I have to say we, we, we continue to be fans of tech. It, it, you know, it's had a challenged month or two. Um, from here, given the conflict that we're seeing, it's very unlikely to see very significant upward pressure on bond yields, um, despite that move in the Fed. And part of the reason is the market is already pricing it in. Now, as you have a challenging macro conditions, um, and because of the inflation pressures that we're expecting to see, you know, companies are going to be challenged uh, with regards to their profit margins. So this is a time that you want quality. This is a time you want big balance sheets, positive cash flow. 
Um, and really a very, very strong business model, which has pricing power. And where do you typically find a lot of that? It's within technology. And of course, now that the fangs have lost um, pretty much all of their gains from 2021, valuations are a lot more reasonable. Um, but now it's not going to be the top choice, but I do think that having an element, an allocation towards big tech at this stage probably does make some sense. Seema, how are you thinking about energy stocks right now? I mean, this group is up some 30% thus far year to date because of the surge that we've seen in oil prices. How much further do you think that, and I guess the commensurate rise in oil prices can still go? Look, it's really difficult to give any kind of prediction on energy prices and commodity prices because it's currently being driven very much so by the, by the geopolitical risk. Uh, when we look at commodities, they're so elevated. A lot of that is because it's got geopolitical premium priced in. Um, so given that uncertainty and given the fact that we have got surging inflation in the US and globally, to us, we look at it and we say, look, if you are concerned about geopolitical risk, which of course um, most of us are, uh, if you're concerned about inflation, then commodities, energy, it serves pretty well as a hedge. So we do look at it as it's not putting a forecast out there on all prices of commodity, where we things are going but we do consider it as a pretty good hedge in this very, very uncertain environment. Nathan, is it the only thing that's going to likely slow inflation, inflation, demand destruction? So when that consumer or that shopper goes to the mall and says, I'm not paying $90 for a pair of jeans, they go to the gas station, I'm not paying six, close to six bucks for gas or I'm going to drive less. Does that help bring down inflation and do you see demand destruction on the horizon? Well, the answer to that is absolutely yes. And uh, uh, as prices rise, you know you're on the you're on the demand curve, and people people demand less. Uh, I think uh, what the Fed is hoping is that there are some other channels in the global economy that will manifest themselves uh, and help bring inflation down. And some of the factors that the Fed has pointed to, uh, in its minutes, uh, one is some further progress on supply chain disruptions. Another one is further progress on, uh, on, on a reduction in commodity prices. And I have to say, given what I'm seeing at the moment, both of those seem uh, quite remote. Now, a third one that maybe is a little more hopeful is as we make progress in better managing the pandemic, and it feels like maybe we're getting to a better place there and that that situation's better. It will allow rebalancing from this red hot commodity intensive goods sector more into the services sector and allow some of these, these goods prices that have been so uh, elevated and rising so quickly, like autos, for example, to kind of uh, come off the boil a bit. Of course, that may raise other issues about services inflation, what that might look like. But I think these are some of the kind of, let me call them exogenous or outside processes that the Fed, again, is hopeful. The Fed has its fingers crossed that these things are going to come through and be uh, supportive of, of lower inflation, in addition to that demand destruction channel that you described. Incredibly uh, helpful insights here to the Yahoo Finance Universe. Thank you to you both. Nathan Sheets, City Global Chief Economist, Seema Shah, Principal Global Investors, Chief Strategist. Have a great weekend.